Hello, this is the Trudy Haynes Show. I'm Trudy, and before I tell you the good things that we have on the show today, I just want to take this opportunity to remind all of you, please get out and vote. That's very important. It's your privilege and it's your right, and we don't want to lose that. We're still fighting for that right to keep that vote going, so don't mess up. Get out and vote. And on the show today, we're going to take you back a little in history where some black soldiers really fought for some of these rights that we enjoy today. Our historian, Kathy Lee, and her hidden footprints, they're going to reenact at Fort Mifflin some things that happened during the Civil War when some of our black soldiers fought and died to preserve their freedom and to get, or re really to get their freedom, and of course preserve our freedom. So be sure that we don't make that all in vain. And also on the show today, our astrologer, Shemaya Bay, is on hand to give us more insight into those heavenly bodies and how they affect our lives. And one of our gems, Cassandra Kane, had the good luck and good fortune to meet and talk with the Bacon Brothers. Boy, what a lucky girl. Well, all that's coming up on the show today. But first, let's go around the town. What's this all about, ma'am? Oh, well, this is Be the Boss. You know, the people are the boss of the elected officials. And we need to act like the boss. And the way you start out is by going to the polls and voting on May 21st. And in every election, uh, this this year we are electing a city uh, a city controller who gets to decide which departments to audit and which departments not to audit. That's very important if you care about your taxes, your property taxes, or if you care about the quality of city services that you're getting or not getting. You should care who the city controller is, and we're electing a district attorney. And the district attorney makes decisions about which kinds of cases will be prosecuted and what kinds of penalties will be asked for. So that's very important to your quality of life is who your district attorney is. And we're electing judges, lots of judges. And the judges really shape how the law is applied on the ground, not just in the cases they rule in, but every time they make a ruling, it really affects all of us. So go to the polls. These people have more impact on your life than the President of the United States does. So it's actually, in my opinion, it's just as important, if not maybe even more important, to get out and vote in your local elections. 2013, May 21st, we'll see you at the polls. When I arrived at the job fair, I was awed. The line at the Philadelphia Navy Yard was around the corner, and I learned that many of the folks had been there for hours waiting to get into Building 101. The fair had opened at 10 a.m., but many had arrived before 9, hoping to get to some of the 50 or more employers who came from all over the city, hoping to hire some of these eager students, parents, even seniors looking for employment. But that was not enough. Later, I found out that some didn't even get in because the employers ran out of material. There was even free counseling offered to those who could take time out. And even though the turnout was more than expected, Councilman Kenyatta Johnson, who hosted the event, realized that we need more of these kind of events. And Philadelphia needs more jobs to offer. Yes, today we have more than 2,000 attendees who have come down to, to participate in my spring annual job fair. Uh, this is the largest turnout I've ever seen, which shows that there's a demand for jobs, there's a need for a progressive policy that will create jobs, so in the future, when we have these type of events, that we don't have the same type of significant uh, turnout, because obviously the larger the turnout shows the more the, the need for people who need employment. But I'm also um, you know, appreciative that we have more than 55 employers came out today to participate, everyone showed up, so that's a good thing, and so you know, as we move forward, my primary purpose is again to make sure that people um, are gainfully employed. We may not know how many got through and how many got jobs. We do know there is a hungry need for employment and that you have a better chance with some kind of education. Hi, 
I'm back with uh, my mentor and trainer, Melvin Garrison, from the School District of Philadelphia, for the Trudy Haynes Show on LifeAndSpiritOnline.com. Um, I'm delighted that he showed up at Fort Mifflin, and Melvin is the go-to person and the expert on the 13th Amendment and you name it. He's also a reenactor and actually was a member of the Park Service and even got me involved into becoming a park ranger for a summer program also because of the interest that he, um, he just made history come alive for me and enabled me to really have a great time as, as a teacher. Melvin? Well, thank you, Kathy, and it's always nice to hear great things about oneself, but I don't consider myself a mentor. I just try to pass on a love for a subject a love for individuals, a love for a topic, just pass on to other teachers. The war starting. Now. And 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 <laughs> if it just if if it goes well, if they pick it up, if they see it, if they feel it, if they feel it the way I do, well, that's great. But um, and that only comes from being around, coming through the Philadelphia Public School System, and having history teachers who made you want to know history, not just learn history. And I think sometimes we, we tend to forget that. Because knowing history is different than learning history. And I know history, I have a love for history, it's a passion, it's, it's just what I do. It's, and, and being in the position that I am, um, I've had the opportunity to pass it on to students and teachers. And I will continue to do so, um, as long as I'm able to. Okay, well then let's get down to the real nitty gritty. And because I really want to talk about um, Abraham Lincoln and whether or not, I'm sorry Melvin, I have to go there. I you can go there. I took a class with you, whether you or not there. he had a constitutional right to, or he extended executive privilege or executive, what do you call that? Executive privilege. Okay, executive privilege. And he's opened the door now to... Okay, and you're talking about the Emancipation things. Proclamation. Yes, go ahead. All right. Lincoln, Lincoln, for all we say about was a skillful lawyer, okay? He knew um, in order to do anything that involved going against the Constitution, he would have to have Congress's approval. The emancipation doesn't violate the Constitution in no way, shape, or form. The emancipation is a wartime measure. And in time of war, measures like that can be passed. Why? Because you are removing from your adversary a resource that he, she, can use against you. So it doesn't violate the Constitution. Which means that's why he had to come back with the 13th Amendment. So when you look at the Emancipation Proclamation, if you read it clearly, and there were several versions, let's, not, let's get that clear. If you read the final version, he clearly delineates where this is to take effect and where it does not take effect, where he had the border states. He didn't want to offend, even though he offered them payment for the slaves and all kind of other things if they would free their slaves, they didn't take advantage of that. So he said, okay. He didn't want to offend them because he was still, he was still, even though, you know, we tend to think that the nation was on solid ground during this, during this, this conflict, this internal, it was a struggle. It was constantly a struggle, okay? A, str a struggle to keep the ship afloat. Because there were those in his own Washington who weren't always in the boat with him. Like maybe McClellan? Well, I'm not going to discuss generals, okay? <laughs> and if you know Civil War history, we went through quite a few, you know, called commander in chiefs. Till we got the one, you know, so he had issues with them, okay? Um, but what he did, he had to, and there were things that precipitated him doing that. Because, and this is just my point of view, 
understand. We didn't need the emancipation to free ourselves during this conflict. How appropriate. We didn't need that. We were beginning to move in that direction anyway. Let's face it. We were walking into various union installations and surrendering ourselves, asking for our freedom, saying what we had to say. And that occurred, and then Lincoln himself had several of his generals who were issuing proclamations. Like Hunter. Okay? Who were issuing proclamations freeing these individuals. So, so he realized, even though he tried to hold them back, restrain them, withdraw your proclamations, one did, one didn't, give arguments about it, he knew it had to come to this. Now what he was concerned about was that the Union was not doing well with the war in the early years. They were losing more than they were winning. And it's very difficult when you, when the papers back then publish casualties and you see names, it comes home. Okay? It leads to draft riots. It comes home. It comes home. So you have these things going on. So he, he, he had to take steps. He had to take steps to one glean public support, so he had to, he had issued this after he had what was considered a union victory, but more it was more of a draw than a union victory, the Battle of Antietam. Okay, he had to issue this at, at a point where it could be be perceived as I really didn't need to do it to help me. I'm doing it to help me not deal with this issue, and the issue was that he had heard. People of color were being used to build Confederate fortifications, Virginia and Carolinas. And they were being let out for 10 and 12 days to work for the Confederates and come back to the plantation. Well, he, he had to stop things like this. Now, question. Didn't that allow, because I know the South had a tactical advantage because of the slave labor that they had. Um, they were on the defensive more, and we had to kind of like go to them. Is that well, true? Well, yes I would, no? I wouldn't. And then they went on the defensive. See, it's hard to, it's hard to say, offense, defense. When you talk about, if you look at the war as a total, total picture, okay. you had battles. Okay, you had situations. You have things occurring. Okay, battle A happens 50 miles over here, and it's in between both sides. You lose 20,000 men. Confederate victory. Battle occurs here 50 miles away, there's 60,000 men, the Union wins. So offense, defense, it's hard to say what, but what eventually happened was that when the losses started mounting up, and in order to keep, like any military situation, in order to keep battles going, a war going, you must have a, a, a resource. You must have manpower. Must have manpower. Okay? Must have manpower. Now Lincoln did admit later on that having these 180,000 plus 200 men of color come to his side aided him. Oh, yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. The South's manpower was being depleted. The South's infrastructure was being depleted. Their manufacturing was going down. Their supply line. The Union had blocked. The Union had blockaded the South from the beginning of the war. All right? They had the Atlantic blockade around. They were coming down to Mississippi, though it was taking longer with Vicksburg and Frederick, those things. But they were, they, were cut, they were strangling them. So their resources, their infrastructure was crumbling. The Union, for various reasons, was, was able to re, keep refurbishing their infrastructure. They had the railroads, they had the food supply, they had all these things that they could draw on. The South had no way, the South had no income. Its income was its cotton that was being shipped north and into Europe. Well, th they cut that off. Even though you had runners that were trying to move things through the blockade, the, the Union cut that off. So you have no way of getting anything in. So eventually, though it took longer than maybe all, many people expected, the Union eventually 
could not sustain battling any longer. Military plan. We talk about history, we talk about it. Yeah, things happen. We talk about the generals. You know, we can play the general game, sure. But if you look at the inner structure, if, if you look at the things you need to sustain an army, to, to maintain a conquest, a campaign, by the time we get into the, the mid-60s, the mid-1860s, the North was able to do that better than the South. And so that ended. So we have the 13th Amendment. This is my last question. The 13th Amendment, uh, I'm going to say with that little loophole, with the final little thing. The um, 13th Amendment, good. Lincoln had to pass because if, okay, keep in mind, was, was slavery legal in the Constitution? In the Constitution. It hadn't gone away, had it? No. Okay, which meant the Emancipation Proclamation was a wartime effort. If the war ends, it ends. Slavery is still in the Constitution. So what occurs when the war's over? So therefore, he had to put an amendment into the Constitution that would negate this returning of slavery. Unless duly convicted of a crime. Well, we can play that word game all we want, but he had to put the, because if that didn't happen, then the war, then the issues that were prevalent, issues that were people were excited about, issues that raised the, the hopes of people of color in this nation would have been trashed the moment Lee surrenders to Grant. Melvin, I want to thank you. You know, you're my brother. Thank you, thank you. Kathy, and of course, you got my opinion. But thank you very much. I enjoy talking, always do, and look forward to seeing you someplace. Yes, you will. Take care. This is Shamaya Bay, reporting for the Trudy Haynes Show. I've been asked to talk about the planet Saturn. That's right, the planet Saturn happens to be going through or is visible within our, uh, from our geo perspective, our Earth center perspective. I've been asked to be, uh, report about that because it's visible uh, during a clear night. So, what is the planet Saturn? planet Saturn astrologically. First, let's do some definitions. What is astrology? Astrology is the way the planetary bodies influence humanity. If you didn't hear that correctly, it's the way the planetary bodies influence humanity. Most of us are familiar with two major luminaries. Um, can't deny them because they're very visible. The sun, number one, and the moon, number two, at night. So dealing with the planet Saturn astrologically, Saturn is known as the god Kronos, not the god that we worship. But it's also in Greek mythology, the god Kronos. Kronos, if you don't, don't know, means time. Astrologically, what does that do? Saturn also rules the zodiac sign of Capricorn. Capricorn, the key word for Capricorn is I use. So Saturn, the energy or the behavior rules old relationships, old friendships, also deals with, uh, rel not relatives, but more like landlords, um, elders, uh, father figures. And what does Saturn, the planet Saturn, want us to do? planet Saturn wants us to be stable and to be secure. The planet Saturn at the moment happens to be in a sign of Scorpio. Scorpio, for all those Scorpios out there, it's all about control, the concealing things, secrets, and it's also about the libido and sexuality. So right now we're going through, at this particular time of the taping, we're dealing with a uh, Saturn-Sun opposition. So what does that mean? An opposition means to do something differently. So until next time, this is Shemaya Bay reporting on the Trudy Haynes Show, and we're talking about the planet Saturn and the sign of Scorpio is making an opposition to the sun and Taurus. If you want to hear more, stay tuned. Shamaya Bay on the Trudy Haynes Show. You've seen him on Fox's hit series, The Following, but did you know the man can sing? Kevin Bacon and brother Michael, Emmy award-winning composer for film and TV, have been playing together their whole lives. The guys have been making music together as the Bacon Brothers since 1995. We were lucky enough to catch up with the guys while they were in town. Here's what they had to say. So I know rock and roll has been a big part of your lives since you were like, yay hi. When did you start making music together? Uh, let's see, I would say Kevin was about two or three, something like that, and I would be playing my guitar. I'm nine years older, so. Um, but I just remember us always playing music together, and it's kind of we're still doing that. 
How would you describe your sound to viewers at home who haven't heard your music? You know, it's pretty uh, much of a combination of the kinds of music that we like. So the first time we did a record, which was uh, almost 20 years ago, 18, 19 years ago, we, they said, what kind of music do you play? We said, well, it's kind of folk rock soul country. So we decided to call it Foro Soko. So the, rec <laughs> the record was called Foro Soko. And that's how we describe our, our music. And, and, and it's amazing that all these years no one's picked up on that. So you guys write all of your own stuff. What's your creative process, like when you sit down to write music or a song? Well, a um, couple of answers to that. We used to collaborate a lot on, on writing songs because when Kevin first started doing that, he really didn't play an instrument. So he would sing me the melody, I'd write and arrange the song. Um, but over the years, Kevin has gotten his skills up so he has his own studio and he can, doesn't really need me to work on them. So we mostly work independently of, of each other. and. I would say we mostly use each other as sounding boards for our work rather than sitting down and writing songs together. I heard an interview where you guys said that in certain parts of the country, you know, certain cities that really dig your music. How do Philly fans stand up to that? It's good. It's good. I'll um, tell you after tonight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, we play Philly, but also we play sort of outlying communities a lot. Actually, we tend to do that a little bit more than playing right in town. And, right. and I think we, we, we often do better. But, you know, all of like, uh, kind of Philadelphia, South Jersey, that the whole area has, has always been really good for us. Speaking of Bacon Brothers fans, you guys have the Tape It Up Lyric Contest. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Take it away. Well, it's a, it's a song I wrote, and um, it's an interactive song. And the Tape It Up story is kind of an um, inspirational message. Tape it up and get back on the ice. It's a, an ice hockey metaphor. So if something goes wrong, you, you don't quit. You get back on the ice and continue. So what happens is people will write an embarrassing or humiliating story that they would want to be sung this song for. So they tell me the story and I pick one that I like and I write a verse to it and fit it into the song. And then usually I write a verse for myself. So uh, between now and tonight I have to write two verses, one from the contest winner and one of my own. And then the contest winner comes backstage and we say hi and we you know, dedicate the song to them. The yeah, thing. exactly. That is so awesome. What's yeah, your fun. favorite story that you've had a contestant? Oh, so there have been so many good. I guess, I guess my favorite one so far is this, uh, this woman from Texas. Um, she wrote and said that she decided she was tired, tired of being lonely and her husband left her long ago and she had grown daughters. So she went into a cowboy bar and sauntered up to this hot guy and started trying to pick him up. And then, she, then he, she said, oh man, you look familiar. He said, yeah, I, I dated your daughter last night. <laughs> oh <my laughs> last night. <God. laughs> that is, that definitely is yeah, a it is. Like, that's yeah. awesome. Really she taped it up. <laughs> <laughs> your fans on Facebook are really sweet. Do you guys sign on and read all the nice comments? We did. Yeah, sure. That's great. Do you guys tweet too? Are you on your yeah. Twitter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, tweeting away. Yeah. We, got, awesome. we, got, we have individual, we have a Bacon Brothers Twitter account. So You guys also have a really dedicated street team. Sure. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, street Team is a group of uh, fans who basically, for nothing, just kind of spread the word and try to bring people out to the shows. You have to, um, you have to appreciate it even when you have a, what we like to say is a small but mighty fan base, you know? I mean, it's really nice when people really um, care a lot about doing the music to the, hearing the music to the extent that they'll actually go and try to, you know, get other people to, to share it with them. Great. How do you like go about being a part of the street team, like to sign up and be a member? Well, you go to the website and then... BaconBros.com is the website. You can sign up for the street team and then there, if we have a gig somewhere um, and we need, let's say we need some flyers passed out or something like that, if you do that then you get street team credits and if you get a certain amount then you can you get uh, some swag or you can come back... Spend a night in my hotel room. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a sure your wife would love that. it's a yeah, whole it's, it's whatever it takes to get people in the seats, you know. You Michael go. will buy you a car. <laughs> Ooh, what kind of car? <laughs> Anything you want. Red Beamer, let's go. Okay. <laughs> so it's great. It's you know it's it, it's one of those things that couldn't exist without social media. And you know when you're in a band and you know there's really no record business anymore, and it's impossible to get played on the radio. So your live gigs are kind of the most important part, and they really help us a lot. Any any place in the country, there it's a great support system. There you have it. Go to baconbros.com and join the street team. I'm Cassandra Kane for the Trudy Haynes Show. Thanks for watching. Well, I'm sorry we have to leave you. Hope you enjoyed being with us. We enjoyed you. Just remember to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, 
and subscribe to us on YouTube. And remember, every Saturday at 9.30 a.m. to watch us online, lifeandspiritonline.com. And remember, if you do fall down, that's not the end of the world. Just get up and start all over again. This Tuesday, get up and go vote. Have a good day.